Hello, and welcome to my presentation, Supporting ADHD and LSD Approach, by me, Javier Carmona. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, currently a rising junior, uh, majoring in psychology and an independent major, which is the interdisciplinary and cross-cultural approach to mental health. And I will be guiding you through my presentation. Quickly, let's go over the agenda. Uh, we'll start off with an introduction to ADHD, then go into pain in ADHD, rejection sensitivity dysphoria, the state of pharma, and then the battle between conventional pharma and psychedelic pharma. Quick disclaimer, I am an undergraduate student. I am by no means a medical professional and offer this presentation as a point of intrigue, not as a recommendation. This is not medical advice. Let's start off with ADHD. ADHD is a disorder with really high prevalence, but also a lot of uncertainty around its prevalence. It's estimated to be between five to 27% of the worldwide population. Why is it such a big difference? We don't really know, but some of that could be from the disagreement behind the understanding of ADHD and what it actually means. Right now we understand ADHD through the DSM-5. The DSM-5 focuses on the, the symptoms such as poor attention, distractibility, and other symptoms that can make people a general nuisance in social situations and particularly classrooms. This is unfortunately somewhat incomplete though, because it doesn't address one of the bigger problems in ADHD, and that is emotional dysregulation. People with ADHD can struggle to regulate their emotions and have and are prone to things such as uh, rejection sensitivity dysphoria, which can lead people to isolate themselves and not have as much time to spend learning and focusing their attention. In other words, it seems like the DSM-5 is trying to fight back the more natural impulses and qualities and focuses entirely on the attentive side while the emotional side goes completely on regard. Another big part of ADHD is its comorbidities. ADHD is a disorder with tons of comorbidities, especially physiological and psychiatric comorbidities. There are around 80% of people with ADHD have a physiological comorbidity, most commonly chronic pain, fibromyalgia, and motor regulation disorders, as well as psychiatric comorbidities such as depression, autism, and mood disorders. So what does this actually mean? Well, it means that people with ADHD have to struggle a lot more with things such as pain, with psychiatric disorders, and treating them is not only about treating the attention, but is also about treating these comorbidities and treating the executive dysfunction that comes with them. So let's talk about pain and ADHD. ADHD often comes with motor regulation uh, problems. This can lead to a heightened muscle tone, increased back, shoulder, and hip pain, and a lower pain threshold or an increased pain sensitivity. This often leads to chronic, uh, chronic, comorbidity, chronic pain comorbidities and an underdiagnosis in chronic pain patients. So what is this connection between chronic pain and ADHD? Well, a study from 2021 seems to link neuroinflammation as the cause. Increased neuroinflammation is seen in both chronic pain and ADHD. And increasing neuroplasticity seems to be a potential pathway to treat chronic pain, specifically through targeting BDNF levels, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Many ADHD treatments also target neuroplasticity and BDNF in order to help alleviate symptoms of ADHD. This is true for many other psychiatric disorders, emphasizing the importance of treating the person and not simply the disease and treating these psychiatric and physiological comorbidities. ADHD also comes with this emotional dysregulation that I talked about earlier, leading to rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria, and problems with socialization. This misunderstanding of social situations and this impulsivity and reaction can lead people with ADHD to start more fights, start more arguments, and overall 
be rejected more socially. This social rejection can lead people to be very depressed, be very sad about their, uh, about their social circle. And this social pain also causes um, problems with attention, as well as this misunderstanding. So what's the, what's the meaning of all this? We have to be treating the person and not just the disease. This is not a new concept and has been around since the found, foundation of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Osler, uh, Dr. Osler even said, the good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So my hypothesis is that LSD can kind of work as a way to treat the person and not just the disease. It kind of helps with treating these comorbidities and treating these secondary issues such as pain and social problems. So specifically, I think it can be done through microdosing LSD. But what is microdosing? Microdosing has to do with a sub-perceptual dose. You're not dealing with tripping all day and like seeing weird colors and such. It's a dose that is around 10% to 20% of a real dose of LSD. So what do we know about microdosing? Well, there was a study in 2019 that actually went into how LSD microdosing or, and other psychedelics is being used to treat different disorders. Among these were ADHD and other neuro neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism and Tourette's. And around 37% of the cohort were treating their disorders with microdosing. And I think it's really important to realize that many of these people were also using conventional treatment along with the microdose. So what did this study actually find? Well, it found that it seems to work for some people. There was statistically significant amount of people that were seeing improvements in their symptoms, were seeing improvements in quality of life, and they seem to think it worked. So let's talk about pain and LSD. Well, in a study in 2020, there was some preliminary evidence that LSD could decrease pain perception in healthy volunteers. This was done through asserting tolerance to cold water and measuring subjective levels of experienced pain, leading way to future studies that could seek to treat chronic pain and LSD by altering pain perception. So basically just improve pain a little bit. We also see low doses of LSD as evidence for treating neuroinflammation, which, as I previously explained, is linked to many psychiatric disorders and chronic pain and ADHD. Uh, then in a study in 2021, there's some preliminary evidence that microdosing 20, 20 micrograms of LSD seems to affect BDNF factor levels in healthy volunteers, potentially pointing at increased neuroplasticity and pathways to help with ADHD and comorbid chronic pain. There's even evidence as far back as 1964 that psychedelics were being used and investigated as potential analgesics. And this study even reported efficacy similar to hydrocodone. What about social function and rejection sensitive dysphoria? Can LSD help with that? Well. The evidence seems to say that potentially, maybe, we don't know. We need more research. But LSD seems to mediate social interactions and can make people respond more appropriately in group settings. My thought is that it helps people by normalizing and creating a barrier between, creating a buffer so people don't act as impulsively to what they deem to be rejection. This buffer and this time to rewind the coil lets people mediate conflict and not engage in as much conflict. This mediation of conflict also leads to less social rejection. You see people having more appropriate group responses. This also promotes better attention because there is less social pain, less pain from random aspects, and it also helps with the quality of life and improving symptoms of depression. 
Social isolation seems to potentiate physical and emotional pain, which can be caused by ADHD, and improving pain perception seems to lessen this social isolation. There's also another potential target for LSD in improving rejection sensitivity, dysphoria, and socialization through the aforementioned impact of LSD microdosing on BDNF and neuroplasticity. In another study, when pro-inflammatory compounds were injected in mice, it seemed to induce social withdrawal and isolation. This could also be linked to the social issues which are found in ADHD and could potentially be ameliorated through the anti-inflammatory response of, ADH, of LSD. So a quick summary, ADHD seems to increase pain. LSD seems to decrease pain response. ADHD has chronic pain comorbidities. LSD seems to help people manage their pain better. ADHD has altered social interactions. LSD seems to promote a pro-social behavior. ADHD, people struggle with rejection sensitivity dysphoria. And in LSD, there is a more appropriate social response in groups. So let's talk about what's actually happening in the world right now with this research. Well, the company Mind Medicine is currently in their phase 2A trials. They're using 20 micrograms twice a week on a three to four day schedule. And they're focusing on inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity, and how LSD can actually, how microdosing LSD can actually help with this. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to use LSD to replace stimulants. And the reasoning behind this is concerns around stimulant use, specifically addiction, cardiac risks, and anxiety. But these concerns aren't as founded as they might originally um, seem. Because there are studies that show that people that are taking stimulants might even have a lower rate of addiction to substances. There's also studies that show that people taking stimulants see no increase in cardiac risks. And people taking stimulants at the right dose, of course, don't have increases in anxiety. And it might even improve symptoms of anxiety, kind of working with that comorbidity that we were talking about earlier. So if you wanna learn more about this, uh, the Beckley Foundation has a lot of good research in ADHD, in LSD microdosing, and I would definitely recommend them as a great source for microdosing. So what's my idea? I think that we can use both. I think that it's possible to, be, to use LSD in order to limit the dose of stimulants so they can be the lowest effective dose, but use them in conjunction. This isn't a novel idea. Adamexetine is already being used in adjunctive therapy with stimulant medication in order to deal with some of the emotional and inhibitory differences in ADHD. So I think the role that LSD could play is similar to adamexetine, but where adamexetine seems to limit social play, according to animal models in the 2015 study, LSD could promote appropriate social behavior when therapy is also being administered as well. ADHD has been treated as a straightforward disorder for way too long. As ADHD research grows, we are coming to understand the complexity behind ADHD. And with this understanding, there needs to be treatments that correctly address the impacts on quality of life in ADHD. So what are the limitations behind my presentation? Spoiler, there, there's, there's a good amount. First of all, there is very limited research on LSD and on microdosing in particular. This is due to issues with legality, you know, the war on drugs, many issues surrounding this. A lot of these studies that I'm mentioning are also very small studies that don't include that many people. And it's possible that they may not hold true for a larger population or perhaps a more specific population it might hold true for. Many of these studies also lack diversity with a lot of the participants being white, male, and Western and educated. This could mean various things for different people and could mean that people from different cultures react differently to micro and people from different ethnicities react differently. And we don't know because there isn't enough research. And this is something that we as a scientific community need to improve. Overall, there's just general uncertainty about microdosing LSD. If you Google it right now, you'll find 100 articles pro and 100 articles against. There is no set understanding of what microdosing LSD is like. And above all, there's the issue of placebo. 
In a study conducted in 2021, researchers at the Beckley Foundation actually found that microdosing might be due to a placebo effect. This was a self-administered study and the citizens were blinding themselves with their own, with their own drugs. And there was a lot of problems with the study, but it points at potentially a more concerning issue with microdosing. So is it placebo? We won't know until le like legalization because there are so many factors that go into it. Perhaps we're not treating the right disorder. Perhaps, for example, the study before focused exclusively on healthy individuals. Perhaps it doesn't help healthy individuals. Perhaps it's like SSRIs. SSRIs don't actually help people that don't have depression. Um, and perhaps we're looking at the wrong objectives. Perhaps the more important part is quality of life improvements in pain perception, in social behavior, and not as much as the attention or, or long periods of time that someone could spend that was initially thought. There's also a lack of control. As I said before, it was a self-administered study. We also don't know about the impacts of therapy. Maybe therapy is that hidden key that we don't, that we haven't acknowledged because that's kind of what happened in macrodosing research as well. We saw that once we added assisted therapy to a psychedelic experience, we saw huge improvements in outcomes. We also don't know if the populations are correct. Again, as I said before, there are so many limitations. There's so many unknowns. Placebo is a limitation along with all the other issues I mentioned before about psychedelic research and microdose. Anyways, I hope this gave you something to think about and thank you for listening to my presentation. And again, this was just my thoughts given to you about where the state of microdosing LSD is at and how it potentially could help people with ADHD. Here's my bibliography. Goodbye.